Welcome to Capital Coffee Connection. I am Liz Hirsch Naftali, and I am really excited to be here today. We have a very special guest. Before we start, I would love to just give a little background on Capital Coffee Connection. This podcast is not meant to talk about politics or policy, but really to talk about humanity, the heart, the home that people come from, and really to have an opportunity to get to know who our elected leaders are. So many times you say to people, oh, I'm meeting with so-and-so, and they'll say, oh, he's just a politician or she's just a politician. And what I've learned is through my work, and I'm not a politician and I'm not a journalist, but I have helped to support candidates. And what I've learned through my work and through my time is that so many people who are running for office or are in office are really beautiful people and they have a great story and they're very interesting. And so this podcast is about people, who they are, and um, I look forward to uh, having this conversation. I am truly fascinated by the fact that 99.6% of all people that walk this earth are the same. What separates us is less than half a percentage point. And what I get from this is that we have so much more in common, and we really are so much the same. And what is that 0.5% that makes us different? And then how can we use that 0.5% to actually bring us together and to find commonality versus finding why somebody is different or not accepting them for their differences? So as we go through this conversation, I think that is one of the themes that is really important um, to keep in mind. So lately I have been, I have been binge watching uh, a show on Netflix called Suits. And Suits is about these very powerful attorneys in New York that are fighting for corporate power, fighting against mergers. And, and the thing that I love about it, whether it's Harvey Specter or Mike or Jessica or Rachel or Lewis, is that no matter what they're fighting, and they fight dark and dirty, both in the courthouse and in the back room, but there's always this strain of humanity that comes through their stories where they actually care even if they don't quite admit it, about different people and about people that don't have as much. And so I love the show and I'm really enjoying it. Um, the reason I bring this up is because today I am going to be speaking with Will Rollins, who is a prosecutor, who has worked um, in law for most of his life and has been there to protect people and to protect the underdog. And one of the things that um, we're not going to talk about, but I just want to give a little background, is that you are running for the Congress seat in California District 41, which includes Palm Springs, Palm Desert, La Quinta, Rancho Mirage, the Sultan Sea. And for those of you who aren't familiar with California, it is famous for a movie that took place in 1963 with Troy Donahue called Palm Springs Weekend. And for those of you who love music, it is the home of Coachella and Stagecoach Festivals. So welcome, Will. Um, I know you're a former prosecutor and that you have been, your passion has been domestic terrorism and national security. And I know that you have, through your work, uh, fought people that have put Ponzi schemes together to take away money from seniors. I know that you have fought a doctor who was selling opiates um, and that you have prosecuted people that were insurrectionists on January 6th. And while I don't see you on suits, I do imagine that you have some of those capacities, but at the end of the day, that most of the work you do is to really make sure, and has have done, is to make sure that people are protected. You currently live in Palm Springs with your partner, Paolo Benvenuto, and um, I want to thank you for having coffee. We're having Alfred's coffee today. I know yours is black. <laughs> Mine right. is my typical uh, cappuccino with oat milk. And so I want to welcome you, and I hope the coffee's good as we talk. Oh, it's great, Liz. So thank you for um, buying this for me. I, I appreciate <laughs> it because uh, the you know a little cash poor as a candidate at this moment. So this is delicious, by the way. Um, Enjoy your Alfred's yeah, coffee. That's great. A little plug for Alfred's <laughs> coffee. Um, okay, so we are going to switch, and now really just talk about who you are, where you come from, and. Um, most of these questions, you just answer how they feel. This isn't a stump speech. This is just really for people to get to know who you are. Um, you were born in Torrance. You grew up in Manhattan Beach. How was it? What was it like to grow up in Manhattan Beach? 
um, and go to school there? Because I know that you're uh, you went to public schools. Right. So what was it like to grow up in Manhattan Beach and schools and, and life there? It was great. And I was lucky to be in a city that had fantastic public schools and to have great teachers and to be born and raised in Southern California. You know, my grandparents, uh, my mom's side met in the Coast Guard during World War II. Wow. Um, moved back to Southern California after the war, started a small business um, that is still in operation today, makes parts for U.S. fighter jets, uh, made parts for the space shuttle. And my mom grew up in Whittier and eventually moved out to the coast. And that's where I grew up and had an amazing childhood there. And great family, great friends, um, a lot of whom were still in Southern California. And really that public education was something that set me up to succeed in life uh, for the rest of time. I mean, yeah. I um, had phenomenal teachers in elementary school, middle school, high school, great mentors, people who pushed me to succeed, who, who helped me get into college, who right. um, I stayed in touch with uh, after graduating from high school too. So, Is there like one teacher that perhaps stands out and something that that one teacher inspired you or said to you that kept you motivated? I mean, there's so many of them. Okay. Um, but, you know, um, Mr. Favre, who was the AP U.S. history teacher at uh, Maricosta High School in Manhattan Beach, it was a phenomenal teacher, somebody who inspired me to become more interested in our country's history and mm -hmm. to do what I could to better it and to teach us about the heroes that have existed throughout our country's existence. And when you have a teacher who is passionate about the subject matter, I think that that can be contagious. And he's certainly had that with U.S. history. and yeah. um, But I had so many others in Spanish and um, English, Model UN, math. I mean, there really were a lot of great teachers in, in that school district. And I know how fortunate I was to be in a district that had the resources and the educators who wanted to be there and were right. committed to their students. Right. And uh, tell me a little bit about your parents. What what did they do and how did they how was it to be what were they what was special about growing up in that house? Yeah, so um, my mom was a public defender and a prosecutor actually. So in it's her genetic. Career. <laughs> yes, it's <laughs> um, yes. The lawyer gene bit me, um, and I think what was unique about that is there's not too many people. First of all, she became a lawyer when ninety percent of the profession was filled with men. Right. And so She's growing, a trailblazer. Yeah. And growing up, listening to her stories about the workplace um, taught me something about um, the lasting effects of misogyny, frankly, on, on the country. Yeah. Um, and but also her background as having served on both sides of the courtroom was really unique, taught me an appreciation not just for our Constitution and uh, the protections we have in place as, as citizens from government overreach, but also the importance of having people in law enforcement who wake up every single day thinking about the burden of keeping our communities safe because it is a burden and it does weigh on you, but it's also an incredibly rewarding career. And so I think from a pretty early age, I had a feeling that I would go that route because of listening to stories that my mom, right. my mom would tell. Um, and my dad also worked in journalism. So I sort of joked that I had like the Fourth Amendment parent with my mom and the First Amendment parent with my dad yeah. um, because he spent his career as a journalist. And he taught me a lot about how fortunate we are to have a free press, how important it is not just to have the freedom to say and do, um, you know, what we want when it comes to speech, but also the importance of having a thriving journalistic industry, mm -hmm. which unfortunately in his lifetime, in his career, it started to diminish because of the um, lack of resources available for local newspapers, right. local media, and w something we're still seeing to continue yeah. to this day. But it, it was very, very lucky to have parents who had both of those careers that I think taught me a lot about what uh, the country has that makes it exceptional and makes yes. it such an incredible place to live. And um, the rule of law and press are, are right up there as the two most important features of our democracy. Yeah. And I, I think that one of the pieces that comes from that, which I always think about, is the perspective of others. You said like how your mom ingrained in you 
the, the life and the struggle sometimes of people that are coming to protect us, what are they going through? What is their life like? Because sometimes we get into this moment where we just think about ourselves and we forget to listen to others or hear others or at least see them for who they are. So I think that that is something that we all as a, as a community of caring people need to think about. Um, it kind of transitions into another question I had. I know that you, you're a Democrat but you worked in the Schwarzenegger administration here when he was governor of California and he was a Republican. And I know that you have family members that are both Democrat and Republican. And while we're not talking about politics, can you talk a little bit about why it's important for us just to talk to each other and to understand each other so that we can actually progress? For sure. I, and I think just on a human level, if you grow up in a split family like that, um, my grandparents, who I mentioned earlier, they were lifelong Republicans. Uh, on my dad's side, uh, New England, they were lifelong Democrats. None of my grandparents had gone to college. Um, they both started small businesses in different parts of the country, and we were close to both families and grew up in a family, an area where also had a lot of friends that were Republicans. Yeah. And so I think that on a human level, when you're growing up in a family that's split or you have friends that are really in both parties, you learn about our commonality. And that's why I actually really appreciate that stat you shared on the gen genome because my experience in that situation with family and friends being in both parties is when you can talk about issues as opposed to labels and particular people or candidates, yeah. you you see how much commonality there really is. And I right. saw that at the Thanksgiving dinner table, and I saw that at, at bars with friends who are Republicans over the years, just talking about, you know, how do you fix immigration or how do you fix our health care system? And if you just take the labels and the people out of it in some ways, the people who are who become polarizing, I think, in a lot of ways because of our media infrastructure, there still is so much common ground there. And I yes. think that's an important um, blessing that I had growing up in a family that was split and, and to have a group of friends who were split. And it also encouraged me to take a job in public service, even for somebody who didn't share my party affiliation, Governor Schwarzenegger, right out of college, at the same time that my sister was working for President, you know, then Senator Obama on his first presidential campaign. So yeah. I think both, you know, our family really um, bonded, I think, over that shared interest in public service and... And the dynamism within it. Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So you are an openly gay Democrat running for office, which is, I think, for... I want people to be listening to this across our country. And so I bring that up because in California, in Los Angeles, in Southern California, most people don't think about that. We just go, okay. But in many parts of our country, people aren't able to be as quite open about who they are, which I think is a shame. But I hope through, again, conversations like this that we can break some of those barriers and actually move forward on these conversations so that we don't have to um, tiptoe or ask weird questions and just be open. Um, how has that been and how is that? Because I know that Paolo and you travel together in the work you do. He is very supportive of the work you do, which is amazing because we need partners that support us. Um, but talk a little bit about that, like your relationship and what it means to you guys um, to be able to work together and for him to support your passion. Yeah, for sure. I mean, and, and he, you know, I always give him a shout out, uh, not just because he's my only source of income, uh, but <laughs> also because he's been incredibly supportive from the beginning. And we both had experiences growing up that I think make us able to relate to a lot of the people in parts of the country where it's not as uh, accepting. And to be honest, I mean, Southern California in the 1980s and 90s, depending on where you were living, also wasn't the most accepting place, including, I think, the South Bay. Yeah. Now, having said that, I know there were, there were worse places to grow up um, as a kid. But for me, I, I think about my experience through the lens of actually September 11th and my thoughts after I walked into my first class of the day, I was a junior in high school and seeing the North Tower collapse and having an instinct of wanting to serve in the military, but knowing deep down that I was gay, I hadn't told anybody, and knowing that our military prevented people who were gay from enlisting. And also knowing that they did that because of a purported threat to national security. 
So when you're a 17 year old kid and you just see your country attacked and you think you want to help, but you're told by your own government that there's something defective about you as a threat to our military readiness, yeah. it's a really shitty feeling. Um, and I think the psychological impact of that uh, stuck with me for a long time through college, but I, I didn't want to give up on that dream of serving in some capacity, which is what led me to go to Dartmouth, took Arabic, thought about joining the CIA, mm -hmm. applied to the CIA, applied to the FBI, never heard anything back, um, and eventually made it to law school and clerked for a couple federal judges, got lucky enough to be hired to join the Justice Department at the U.S. Attorney's Office here in the Central District of California, right. which covers all of Riverside County, and they have a national security division. And so it was a really long path for me to get into law enforcement and national security. But I, I tell that story because I think it shows how important it is that we have a country where people can be who they are and seek to rise and fall based on merit. And if you have barriers to that, artificial barriers, it hurts our collective security, our collective national security and, and our economy too. And I think, um, you know, I, I often am reminded of that story about all of the Arabic translators and linguists who got discharged after September 11th when we needed them in the military because they were gay. And that's an example of why it's so important, I think, not just for on a human rights level to have people able to achieve whatever they want, but also for our collective security as well. And, um, you know, Paolo had similar experiences uh, growing up in Seattle, uh, mm -hmm. which also is, you know, considered a, a progressive area. But again, 1980s and 90s, it's not always it's not that long ago when it wasn't. It wasn't. Yeah. You know, it reminds me of this quote um, by James Baldwin, and he says, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. And, you know, I think that's part of our, our struggle, which is to make sure that we keep pushing on. It doesn't mean that we're going to fix things right away, but we have to keep pushing on. Um, and your story sort of reminds me of that quote. Just on a funny level, do you have any funny stories about like right in the beginning when you were a public defender, something that you did that was amazing, something you did that was embarrassing? Just curious. Well, uh, so federal prosecutor, uh, that's what I, that was my first first job. Yeah. And um, so I, I think the the funny, funny, I guess in air quotes, I can say this because the guy ended up getting convicted. But I mean, I was six weeks out. I had, I had never tried a case before. I had never argued a motion mm -hmm. in federal court before. I started in September of 2016. And they said, you've got a trial in six weeks. And this guy was the number two opiate prescriber in the state of California. He got busted for structuring his currency transactions at a Beverly Hills clinic that he had. He would walk to four different banks nearby and deposit uh, thousands of dollars in cash just under that $10,000 limit. Because, so no one was can see watching. Yeah. Right, right. And he, so he would avoid the reporting requirement. And he was cashing money that he had received from people who wanted Oxycontin prescriptions. And they were handing him cash. And he had so much cash, he didn't know what to do with it. And structuring, as a lot of uh, prosecutors, if they're listening, know is actually a pretty difficult type of case to pursue, a standalone structuring charge, because you have to prove they intended to evade the reporting right. requirement. And so I, I was faced with that trial six weeks after I started with no prior experience in the courtroom. Now and, that's a Suits, that's from Suits, okay, <laughs> that's, that's a show. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. and it's it was scary, uh, you know, it, it was. And you prevailed. We, we won. You won, We okay. won, we were able to convict him, and um, I was horrified. I mean, I remember thinking, at the moment when I, after I gave my opening, it was the first opening I did with, with jurors in the room, um, and thinking about how nervous I was, and I'm like, I don't know that I want to do this ever again. Um, but then you, you see the result, and right. you see the conviction and the ability to protect the community from you know, horrible opiate epidemic, and somebody who was a prolific prescriber of drugs that made it made their way into the market in California. Yeah. And I mean, that is a rewarding experience as scary as it is. And it was one that I, you know, was really grateful to have incredible mentors and colleagues in the office who were with me through that, because that, of course, makes it 
so much better when you're going through yeah. a nerve wracking thing like that. Yeah. But it makes you better also when you put yourself in a place that's a struggle. Right. Again, right. confronting something. Right. Um, okay. We are now going to jump to the part where I ask you just a few questions just to get people to know little light things about you that I think are important. What's your favorite meal? Mexican food. I would uh, say. What specifically? Well, margarita, of course. Well, that's not food. Okay, let's just be clear. That's a drink. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's maybe. <laughs> and I'm a not saying question. it badly, but okay. So your favorite drink is a Mex- is a margarita. Yeah. Well, I also just am thinking of my own habit of yeah. eating the entire basket of chips and guac yeah. before the meal actually comes. You know, with the margarita. Exactly. But, um, you know, I mean, like I'll do chicken enchiladas. I like fajitas. Um, there's a junior super deluxe burrito at a small hall in the wall restaurant uh, called El Tarasco in Manhattan Beach. That's a, a that's great a plug spot. for El Tarasco. Yeah, yeah. there's also um, Loco Charlie's in Palm Springs that has some pretty tasty fajitas. Good. Uh, so you know, there's a lot of good Mexican food we're blessed to have in Southern California. We are. We truly are. Yeah. Um, okay. Where would you go on vacation anywhere in the world? If someone said you have two weeks, where would you go? Croatia. <laughs> Why? Yeah, I mean, I just heard it's incredible. Okay. So that's – and, you know, if you're trying to detox and uh, have some relaxation, that seems like a good a good spot, okay. right? And they that's filmed a... a lot of Game of Thrones in, in Croatia. Yeah, right? Croatia is a beautiful country. Yeah. It's really I've beautiful I've never, never been, and I've heard, I've heard it's amazing. Yeah. Um, okay. And what is your favorite hobby? Good question. I mean um, – when I've got some downtime. If you have downtime. Yeah, I really like to hike in the Coachella Valley. And for folks who haven't had a chance to do that now, obviously we're in July, so it's uh, a, little hot. a little bit hot to do that. But some of the trails in Palm Springs are really incredible. Yeah. And being able to see the valley from an elevated point, because a lot of people often go visit and they stay at the hotel, their hotel or right. uh, something like that. But if you get up into the elevated parts of Palm Springs, Rancho Mirage and um, other areas, it's an incredible view and yeah. a really great way to spend a Saturday. Yeah. I'll just say when my son played basketball in high school, not so long ago, I went to some tournaments and we were in Palm Springs and we would go hiking um, on the in, in between games and on uh, on these trips. And it is phenomenal. Just the desert landscape and the views and the air, obviously, again, too hot right now, but this was in December and it was just beautiful, beautiful L- deserts. Lucky to have a great district. So. Yeah. Um, okay, now we're going to play this little game called Kiss, Mary Trash. Others may know it with a different name, but we don't do any killing here. <laughs> so I'm going to ask you three things and then answer them as you wish, please. But if you want to add anything of why you answered, please, you know, do so. There's just a few of them. Um, if you were going to have uh, an evening to relax, three things, Netflix, reading, meditating. Oh, I'm going to kill the meditating. Sorry, we don't say kill. <laughs> we trash we, meditating. We, we trash meditating. Um, and I would probably marry the Netflix because I just have gotten really addicted to it. You know, um, mm-hmm. it's <laughs> there's a lot of good content out there. A lot. And then what was the thir- reading? Reading. We've got and um, those are yeah. It's and it's. So you'd probably re- you'd kiss reading. Yeah, I'd but kiss you'd marry reading. Netflix. Yeah, I think I I think that's true. I mean, okay. I wish I was you know I wish I could marry reading, but right now I'm just hooked on on Netflix. Unfortunately, okay. like most of the country, probably. Uh, yeah, is, a lot so, of us so, are yeah. exactly as I said in my beginning. Um, okay, three meals: breakfast, lunch, dinner. How would you rate those? I would trash breakfast. Okay. I would marry lunch actually, and I would kiss dinner because i think if you have a big enough lunch uh you can you can make it through the day you can have a light something for dinner or not even have dinner exactly and i actually most people like to eat late which i i feel like it just i don't know i'm more of like a 4 p.m junior super deluxe burrito sounds good yeah sounds good i'll meet you at 4 (laughs) p.m okay now coachella and stagecoach both take place in your district so i'm going to ask you a question which could get you in in trouble but pop country hip-hop Ooh, yeah, this is so I've been to Coachella once, by the way, and I felt that was when I was 25 and I felt like I was 10 years older than everybody else there. So I haven't haven't been back since then. But I'm looking forward to going again when I can afford the tickets at some point in the future. Um, But I would marry pop. I have to I just have to say that Um, I like a lot of different types of music. Grew up listening to a lot of punk rock, actually. Um, which I know is not in the selection, but yeah. that was a big thing in the South Bay. And yeah. my friends who are still like almost 40 now are Punkers. R- raging out to like Black Flag and, you know, no effects. It's, Good. yeah. So um, I would say 
I would trash, ooh, it's going to get me in trouble, but country is just, I don't listen to it as much as I listen to hip hop too. Okay. So uh, I would say kiss hip hop, Mary pop, trash the country, although reluctantly, um, reluctantly do, doing that. I understand. You're just doing it because good... we're playing a game. Right. I right. get it. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, pasta. This is a really intense question. Fusilli, spaghetti, or penne? Oof. See, this is where we need Paolo. Yeah. And his Italian DNA. Yeah, Paolo Benvenuto. <laughs> right, right, exactly. He just made some great pasta last night, actually. Um, okay, give me, give me the options one more time. Fusilli, penne, spaghetti. I'm going to marry the spaghetti. Good. I'm going to trash the fusilli, and I'm going to kiss the penne. Sounds good. Yeah. I kind of go with that one. Um, and then last question. Golf? Tennis, pickleball. <laughs> oh man, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna marry golf because it's something I always want to be good at, but uh, can't can't be good at at this moment because uh, <laughs> you don't have enough time due to lack of skill. Also, yeah. that's a big factor. But um, I'm gonna trash the tennis because I just think that one's gonna be out of my reach. Uh, just <laughs> it's not enough early start there. And I'm going to kiss the pickleball because it's something you can apparently really age into. And uh, I'm looking forward to that. You're so, looking forward yeah. to aging into pickleball? Yeah. 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 Okay, and, good. And, and the one time I played it, I did really well. So it's like a hybrid between ah, ping pong. Ah, so there was and... some talent there. Some talent showed up. Yeah. tennis, okay, But tennis is tough. I mean, I wish I was better at that sport too. Golf, eventually, I'm going to I'm gonna nail it. Because I always you hear the stories about people who get older and can really master golf. So Well, and also Palm Springs. Golf is like sort of synonymous with living in the desert. Desert region. Right, right, exactly. And you have a lot of beautiful courses down in Palm in in your district. Oh yeah, yeah, it's amazing, amazing courses. Um, uh, unfortunately, a little too. Some of them are too expensive, but um, there's some great public courses out there Good. too that that are within striking distance from within me. Striking so. distance. Good. Um, so, the last thing I wanted to ask, and I, I've been asking other folks, is it's a simple question, but it's a dynamic one. What brings you joy? And in addition to what brings you joy, what do you think you can bring to others through that joy? Um, because I believe that joy has a ripple effect. It, you start off in, in small amounts and then it gets bigger and bigger as you share it with others. And I think it's one of the things that is uh, sometimes missing and sometimes really one of the most important things that we can have individually and then share with others. So could you talk a little bit about how how what brings you joy and what you see as being able to bring joy to others from that and from who you are? Yeah, I mean I I think it's purpose. Purpose brings me a lot of joy. And if and you know I've had I've been fortunate to have some really great purposes I think throughout my life and career. And if you can find something that gets you up in the morning because you believe deeply in whatever it is that you're doing, that brings me joy. And it doesn't mean that every part of it is always joyful, right. right? I mean, I talked about my story of being nervous as shit with that first trial that I had. Um, right. And I hope I can use that word on, on the podcast. I think other people but... have heard that word before. <laughs> okay. And probably most of our listeners have heard it and have used it. It just occurred to me the second time I used it. So yeah. then I was like, oh, but um, yeah, I mean, but I think also having the ability to do something that is meaningful for our country, really, and in, in, and in a career. It doesn't have to be uh, public policy related or government service related, but getting up every day and having a purpose is something that really gives me a lot of joy in life because I think without it, you turn inward. And, you know, if you're left with your, your thoughts of, um, you know, how do you make things better for just yourself, I think that that can take people into a place that brings them less joy. Whereas if you focus on a purpose for your community and your family, um, that gives me a lot, a lot of happiness, and it gets me out of bed in the morning. Yeah, no, it's a beautiful answer, and I think it's it it means a lot because if we can share with others and have connection, also, um, that's that's the basic philosophy of joy is being connected. Yeah, um, and like you said, if you turn inward and you don't connect. Uh, you're missing something that's really important for humanity and for our hearts. That's right. And I think no matter your purpose, it ends up being you'll find others who share it, who share a similar purpose. And that's a great way to build community. Yeah, it's a good answer. It means a lot. 
So I want to thank you so much for coming here today. And I wish you wonderful success and happiness and joy in your journey. I want to thank the folks at Stampede Ventures here for co-producing this and helping to make this possible where we can share humanity, hope, heart, love with everybody um, so that people will start to understand that we're sort of all in this together. Hi, it's Liz. Please join me every Tuesday for coffee to talk about heart and humanity with our elected leaders. Ciao.